So uh, this is the second in our series of how to design electronics. Uh, like last time, it's live. So, you know, anything can happen. It could all go horribly wrong. But I thought this time we would look at timers. And uh, obviously clock, timers, clocks are in absolutely everything. Um, we obviously just don't notice them quite so much. Uh, obviously, all computers have got them to make them do things. Your egg timer, you know, for boiling your egg is, is even a clock. So what I've got for us, uh, so we're going to look at um, what are called monostable multivibrators, which is a fancy word for a clock. Uh, we've got some stuff on quite a few, I think we've got four as tables that we'll, we'll have a, a look at. And, and then uh, I've got some stuff on pulse modulators, so we can have a look at them and where they're used. And um, we've got crystals, uh, we've got a knot gate, it's the teaser I put out of how fast will a knot gate go if you try and use it as a clock and what happens. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up with um, four bit uh, binary counter and phase shifting because uh, that's quite a, an interesting experiment. Right, okay, so I have got here, so if you can see here, um, last time the circuits weren't quite big enough for people, so hopefully this time I've printed them out a little bit bigger, so hopefully you can all see that easier than what we did last time. So I thought we'd start with what a monostable um, multivibrator is, which means it's only stable in one state. And this circuit here is one I actually designed this some time ago, and I've used it quite a bit with ARM chips to, um, to give it a multifunction on, on a switch. I wanted a switch which I could either just press to reset the ARM core, or I could press and hold it, and then after a while, it would then switch the boot pin on the arm core. And then if I released it, it would then also sort out the reset. So I've used this circuit quite a lot for um, uh, multifunction of, of, a, of a pin. And so most of these things are governed by dead easy equations. Um, so this one here, as I've scribbled here at the bottom, it's this resistor. R1 and this capacitor C1. And essentially, when we press the button, it causes this capacitor to charge. When it gets to the threshold voltage of the lock gate, then the LED comes on. And then when we release the button, well, this then goes to logic zero, which switches on this gate, which then allows that capacitor to very quickly discharge. And um, just on here, which is nice and easy to see, but if we, uh, I mean, I've made the time on this one, I think it's about five seconds before that light comes on. And then as soon as I release the button, it's then reset and it's ready to go again. So as a simple timing circuit, that's a, a dead easy way to, um, well, if we even want to make an event, or say, I, I tend to use this circuit for um, multifunctions of pins, it works quite well. The other thing which I will mention now, because we're talking about clocks and timers, is decoupling on the power rails. So everything I do has a usually, I usually use a couple these days. Um, this is a very 100 nanofarad, uh, usually a ceramic. I usually slap that across the power rails of all the chips for decoupling, particularly when we've got clocks going on. If you, if you don't decouple, you'll end up with a lot of electrical noise and messed up signals on your board, which uh, isn't a good thing. So that's a dead easy monostable. The other monostable I was going to share with you is the very popular 555 which uh, I'm sure everyone knows and loves. Uh, it's been around since, uh, I did a bit of checking on this, it's been around since 1971. So that's older than me, I'm pleased to say. So with this circuit here, again, it's a dead easy equation, 
So there's nothing complicated. Um, it's a standard configuration uh, with a resistor and a capacitor. And the way these timers work is the trigger signal, it's high and then it has to go low for a short amount of time. And that low time there, which we'll call T low, has got to be shorter than the duration that we want this pulse to be, this output pulse here, we'll call that T high. So just by way of example, uh, we're looking at this top LED here. So if I, if I just press that quickly, the timer works perfectly. You know, or I could adjust the resistor here and it works brilliantly. But what I've discovered with this type, with this popular chip, if you hold that down too long, then the timer circuit doesn't work properly. So there is a trade-off with using uh, these chips. If I really now release that, see now the button goes off. If I do it quickly, life is great. If I hold it, Life is not so great. Yeah. So there is a, there is a limitation I find with that chip. Um, this this DSS MMV actually does mean it is actually connected ground to there, but it, it looks it looks prettier if I, I didn't put that on. The other thing I tend to do if I'm using this sort of circuit, little tip, is if you're using a variable resistor like I am here with this variable pulse, which is what this is, and this is the uh, that chip, is it sometimes I find a good idea to add another resistor in there. So that resistor, we'll call that R1 dash, becomes the minimum resistance of that timing circuit. That makes sense. So if you are using it, it's a good idea to put a few of these limitations in. Um, just, just so you don't end up getting caught out. There are ways of dealing with this problem here. You could put some other electronics in just to create a pulse as, as ways of dealing with it. Um, so, but, but it is a, a limitation. Uh, it, I've got a question still on the monostables. Yeah. Um, is this related to how you could do a power on reset? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, in fact, there are chips. In fact, if you're just doing power and reset, yeah, you, you can just use a resistor and a capacitor. Um, <clears throat> in fact, um, power on reset, if, if you had uh, an ARM chip or any chip would do really with a reset, yeah, a lot, a lot of these power and reset, one way to do it is simply a resistor and a capacitor. That's a very easy way to do a power and reset, and that'll work on most chips. Um, there's another way of doing it. It's actually more expensive, but it's probably a, a bit more reliable. There's a chip called the Max 803. And this chip of power on reset will wait until the power rail is stable and still hold the reset low for something like 250 milliseconds. So, okay. If, if your power rail is not particularly stable at power up because it might be a soft start with your DC to DC, then this chip uh, will actually ensure a clean power up. However, as I say, uh, Maxim is never cheap. And if you can get away with just a resistor and a capacitor, um, it's cheaper still. And I think you'll probably find you might even not need that. You may even find that this is internal inside inside the chip to start with. So the answer to your question is yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. What I was trying to do was to get uh, power supply to come on um, when the mains comes on and stay on until some software switches it off. So I need a pulse when the power arrives. Yeah, so uh, so you need to make sure the power rail is stable before before you pull your other electronics out of reset. Yes. And yeah, so um, 
you could you could use if we go go back to um, yeah, so this circuit here, um, so you, you can download this. It's already there for you to download. So you could use this uh, this here. So it's essentially, or you just you just tie and um, get rid of that, and just tie that to say the, the plus five volt rail. So in fact, you don't, you don't even need that or 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 that section. So yeah, you, you could use that circuit, and that'll do the job for you perfectly on power up. Okay, thanks. No worries at all. So I'm, I'm being of some use. <laughs> right. Okay. Then let's keep let's keep keep chugging along, shall we? Right. So uh, the next AMV before we get to the really exciting stuff. Um, again, the five 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 flavor of the month. Um, uh, the, the the very simple equation uh, which they give you, which is the frequency is a function of this capacitor. That resistor, R, R, the resistor here, R2, which you might be too small to see, and there's another resistor over here. And there's a little trick which I often pull off if I'm using this circuit is if you make the one resistor, R1, this one here, at least say 10 times larger than the other resistor, R2, then by and large, R2 becomes um, somewhat insignificant as far as the calculation is concerned. And then you've got a much simpler equation um, because that disappears. 1.7 over 2 is 0.7, 1.4 over 2 is 0.7, of course. And then we just got our, our C1 and, and, our, and our resistor. And that works um, um, amazing, amazingly well. In fact, I've even, I've even got it on here um, working for us uh, with, with a, a twiddly knob uh, and a flashing LED. I think if I twiddle that one. No, twiddle that one. There we go. So we can uh, we can make uh, hopefully that's is that refreshing? <laughs> yep. Hopefully it's refreshing. Yeah, hopefully it's picking up. But maybe a flashing light is enough to make it keep refreshing. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll leave that flashing. I was going to turn it off, but that that might that might keep the refresh rate. So there's a dead easy circuit. Um, so these chips are about 40 pence each. They, they, they really are as, uh, as cheap as chips. Ba boom Right, okay. Um, the other one, some of the more exciting stuff here now is uh, crystals. And um, hopefully if I swap my camera to the oscilloscope. So I've got a tiny crystal on here. So there it is. It's a tiny, 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 tiny square. Um, you know, you'd, you'd lose it under your thumbnail pretty much. So the one I've got here, crystal oscillator, again, I've got decoupling. All I have to do is tie it to the power rails and that's uh, actually 25 megahertz, this one. And if I've made this one here such that we can connect this one <coughs> up to uh, the oscillator, there it is. Right, so if I swap screens for us here to camera three. Right, let's get rid of, why won't that disappear? There we go. Right, so this is camera three. So I'm hoping now. So what's interesting with crystals is you get what's called harmonics. That is to say, um, you get other frequencies chucked in there. So this is the output from a from a crystal um, that we've got on our board here. As you can see, it's not a perfect square wave at all. And uh, I think if we go to cursor and timing, here we go. So if we move these around. We can probably find out roughly. There we go. So roughly, so you might not be able to see that very well, but that says 25 megahertz, which is the speed of the crystal. Now, here's the thing we've got to be careful of with crystals. This is actually, I've just swapped this to the frequency domain, which is called a Fourier transform, where it'll actually look for us at the frequency components of a signal. 
And as you can see, we've got a number of spikes. And if we move, I think it's this one. There we go. So if you move them along, so this is showing frequency. And in the center there, at the top right of the screen, it tells this tells us the frequency of the spike in the in the middle of the screen. So I've got a spike there in my frequency domain from that 25 megahertz, believe it or not, at 25 megahertz. That's a good thing. What's not such a good thing, and this is called harmonics, is I've got one here at um, about 50 megahertz. I've got another here at 75, roughly. So you can see at multiples of that clock, I've got more signals coming out than what I want. Yeah. And so this is going all the way up to what well, about 175 megahertz. I'm still seeing frequency components from that 25 megahertz clock. And these are called harmonics. And 175 megahertz is the ninth harmonic. And so when we just have got clocks in our circuit, we've got to think about, well, where are the harmonics? So what we'd have to be careful of, if we had, say, 25 megahertz, and then somewhere else in our board, we had 50 megahertz clock, there could be a problem with an overlap, or probably worse still, in fact, you can see the next one's actually quite low. It goes, that's 25, that's 50, that's 75. Sorry, Stephen, can I ask, is, is there one at 12 and a half to then? What's the one before 25? Is, is that a virtual uh, no, no, one? No, yes. that, that's, that's before that one. Yes, that's the one. Is that DC? What is that? Yes. Yeah, that's a DC component. Oh, yes, DC, fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I glossed over that. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's um, that, that's uh, we don't we don't worry we don't worry too much about that one. So it's nothing to do with Nyquist then. Oh, now you're asking me complicated questions. Um, the Nyquist rate has to be twice the sampling frequency, doesn't it? Yeah, um, unlike yeah. very low frequency. Um, yeah. yeah, you get very low frequency artifact effectively. Yeah, you know what? It, it wouldn't be on the wit of man um, if if they just suppressed that, so you, so you didn't start raising questions. Well, it is a square wave. Yeah, what's well, from a square? In fact, I've got here. Well, it is, it is DC then, isn't it? It's pure square wave. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. actually, just oh, hang on, it's on the other camera, actually. So just on, if I just swap back a second for us, um, those who aren't familiar with this. Yeah, but a square, square wave is all harmonics. Yeah, exactly. So I wasn't sure who, who, who's seen this before. But yeah, so that's a square wave. That could be our clock. Yeah, and it's made up of lots of other frequencies. So, and this is another reason why we have to use decoupling. And, you know, the discussion we had earlier about capacitors and capacitor types. When you start getting to these higher frequencies of 175 megahertz, a 100 nanofarad capacitor might not do a lot of good for decoupling at such high frequencies. Because, getting into EMC here now, which is great, because what happens is with capacitors, this is frequency and this is impedance. Um, if I get this right, I think with capacitors, I think they start to, they, they, they go down and then they start to go up again. So you start, you start to have impedance problems. So a high capacitor value, say 100 nanofarads, might be over here. And a 10 nanofarad capacitor might be over there. So the 10 smaller the capacitor, the better the filtering effect it will actually have. And it's a, it's a property of the material at the end of the day. So just one thing to, thing to watch out for when, when, you've, uh, when you've got clocks. So that's why you might have a lot of very small sorry, in parallel. Can, sorry, can I yeah. ask you something about the capacitors? And 
do they behave the same uh, independently of the chemistry? So if it's a ceramic capacitor or is an electrolytic capacitor or is a tantalum capacitor? Uh, yeah, it, it is It is the, the chemistry of the material. Um, yeah, so you wouldn't use an electrolytic for decoupling, um, or certainly not of a clock or, or use it for anything really. And even in ceramics, there, there are different types. You've mentioned X5R and to X7R. If, if, I'm, if I'm going to these high clock frequencies, I'll probably use what's called an N, uh, NPO, I think, or NOP capacitor, which has got even better characteristics at these high frequencies. So let's just hop back there, shall we, to our other screen. So just coming back to the harmonics, is the goal of that crystal outputting all those harmonics that it approximates to a square wave rather than a sine wave? Or is that just an artifact of what the crystal is doing? Um, it's, I would say it's more of an artifact more than anything, really. Yeah. Um, so, no, so if we swap back to our other screen, there we go. So you can see our sign. So it's not it's not a perfect square wave in the slightest, is it really? But uh, it's 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 pretty close to a square wave. <laughs> so, so there are. So, this is only showing the ninth harmonic um, within that. So, it's not uncommon in in when you, when you're looking at EMC and clocks to get even like the sixteenth harmonic. And then, so I'm I'm always looking for what frequencies could actually propagate out of my board, and it's it's usually multiples of a clock, and usually by the by here. When you do get, when you, if you ever do any EMC work, usually when, when you get spikes like, like, like these, uh, when, when you're looking at your EMC score from 30 to say, you know, uh, one gigahertz, you, you can pretty well guarantee that if you ever see these spikes, these sharp spikes, um, in, in a design, you can guarantee it's gonna be caused by a clock every time. Right, interesting experiment. The other interesting experiment I've got for us here is with um, how fast can a knot gate go? So I, I was actually quite surprised by, the, by this little experiment. Um, let's just switch this back to frequent time domain. So, why put together here? Are these, is this camera still working okay? This this nonsense we're having. Is it still is it still okay? Yeah, that's readable. Yes. Okay. Yep, that's good. Good, 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 good. Right. So, um, so there's a crystal clock, and usually the crystal clocks are going to be multiples of um, you know megahertz. You know, you probably wouldn't use one less than well. If you're using a real-time clock, uh, you know, if you had one of those, you'd, you'd have one uh, usually about 3.768 kilohertz, they're quite low. The UG for your processes, you're going to be jacking up to several megahertz. Those 555s, which I didn't mention, are usually good for up to about half a meg. So, you know, whilst in theory you could say, well, I, I could make it run at 100 meg, well, actually, no, you can't. Uh, they, they, are, they do have limits within them. So I thought to myself, how fast can you make a NOT gate go? You know, with a NOT gate, the output is not the input. So if you just loop it back on itself and just probe the output, in theory, I should have a, should have a square wave clock. Uh, turns out that's not what happens at all. So I've done it here for us. So and we'll swap the screen in a second. So this is the tiny, tiny knot gate, which you probably can't see at all. Uh, can we, uh, we can probably adjust the camera here slightly for us. Uh, okay, that might. There you go, that's worked, hasn't it? Yeah. Right, we're getting there with the tech now. Right, so yeah, so that's our, that's our tiny crystal oscillator. Yeah, that, that's our 555 chip, which is quite a bit bigger, but it'll only go up to half a meg. 
This one's 20, 25 meg, but obviously you can get them much higher. And this is a tiny single not 74 series NOT gate, which I've just fed the output to the input, which is in my circuit. So if I swap to our other screen, there we go. That will disappear. Right. So um, this is what you get out of it. Um, so you've got to zoom in a little bit. I've discovered. I had a play with this earlier. All right. So if we zoom in, uh, hold right. Okay. So. <clears throat> What, what, I, what we find is the speed with which this thing will, will, will tickle along. I'm just moving the points on the oscilloscope. So if you feed the output to the input, I hope you can see what frequency that says. 250 megahertz? Yeah, exactly. That, that, that is ripping along, isn't it? Mm. However, what, I've, what we've also discovered is what's not so great is if we swap to the amplitude. I was going to say you're not going past trigger levels, are you? No. Barely. So no, exactly. So about 2.4 to 2.6 volts. So um, it, it's, it's not such a great deal at all. I was actually really surprised at the sheer speed um, at that, that, that it tickled along at. So uh, I did also then, which is interesting, <coughs> I wondered what about the frequency domain? What do we get out of that? Oh, that's going to be ugly. Uh, uh, is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Ooh. So. Uh, well, it's quite close to a sine wave. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Spot on. So, um, where is our, can we find it, is it picking it up? I mean, if I wanted to sort this generator, only bats could hear. There you go. So it's got, it's pretty close to a sine wave, just as you say, which is basically the slew rate of the gate, isn't it really? There's our spike at about what, 260, 270 megahertz. And uh, there isn't much else. The, the, these are the spikes, which you can see here. The, these are usually just background noise, so I don't pay too much attention to, to these levels here. So, in, in fact, it, it's actually it's actually quite a sweet sine wave, really, really, isn't it? But the voltage levels, um, what, 2.4 to 2.4 to 2.86. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's very slightly useless. So what I did do out of interest just before we came on fine today, and I'm glad we've got a solution to this camera problem now. I did actually for us, I had I downloaded the data sheet for this particular chip. Yep. And they they if, if you Take the reciprocal of about 250, 60 megahertz, you get an answer of around four nanoseconds, which of course is the propagation delay. I'll oh, get rid of that, which is pretty much the propagation delay of the chip. So it's actually not an unreasonable answer, is it really, if you look at the data sheet? Won't that be based of temperature dependent though? Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Well, this is obviously as uh, room temperature here. Um, yeah, yeah, I did wonder about that. Um, oh, that John experiment was going to have a look at. Um, um, how warm does the chip get when you're doing this as well? Uh, it's, it's as cool as a cucumber. Okay, straight. I, 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 I did. I've seen a variant of that circuit with three knot gates in a ring. Apart from slowing it down, would that have other effects like making it a square wave? Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. They're increasing the propagation delay. 
Well, funnily enough, I was going to suggest using a, something like a 7404 inverter chain to stabilize the uh, yeah. feedback loop. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, so what, 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 what you've seen here before is, is obviously it's three of them to get back to a knot gate. So that's what you've seen, yeah? Yes, so that's you're, it. Yeah, yes. so using the propagation delay of each of them. So it, 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 it's there really. So obviously, you'd, um, you'd uh, only have a third of that frequency of, you know, 270 divided by three. Uh, which is what about 70, 80 megahertz, and, and of course you'd, you'd, you'd probably get some sensible voltage levels out of it. What I did try as an experiment, and um, I don't see why we don't have a little go with this, is I did try back on the crystal, and it didn't make any difference whatsoever. Oh, that's no, this one. There we go. Well, earlier, I, I tried this yesterday and um, it stopped working. Is I, I got some freezer spray to see if I hit fit it with freezer spray, does it actually affect the performance of the of the crystal? Any thoughts? I know the performance is uh, affected if you try to apply physical pressure on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I know, so, in fact, if I just swap back to the screen to, to hear for you, uh, boom, 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 boom. I was going to say it'd be different for a TCO. Right. So, yeah. So, so that's the crystal at now minus 50. And uh, it did actually stop working um, after a while. But it's it's completely impervious to it, isn't it? And uh, I'm I'm just hitting that with uh, well, it's like a snow mountain on top of it right now. And I think the I think the other chip I think this had a slight performance change. Um, oh no, it's that one. Find something you want to. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's just dandy, isn't it? Tell you what. Don't about. think you want to be up at fifteen point eight volts. No, uh, hang on. Let's just hit the let's hit the the, the magic auto. <laughs> Can't go wrong with an auto button, can you? There we go. Right. So this is oh, that's uh, that's looking a bit ugly, isn't it? Right. Okay. That's having a bit of a bad experience. Right. That's that's the knot gate again. Freeze it. Well, there's a bit of a performance change, but seems to be rock steady at minus fifty degrees. So anyway, it's a, a bit of a snowy mountain on that now. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's 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 move on, show to some other other experiments with clocks. Sorry, Stephen. Can I just ask? Do you um do you actually want your clock signal to be closer to a sine wave, or do you want something with a better defined rise? Yeah, it's it's a trade off between. Um, uh, being a square wave, so so it works functionally, but it, if if it's too much of a square wave, then as we saw, you're going to start having lots and lots of harmonics, and that could cause you problems with radio emissions. So you want you want so you, you can't get away from not having harmonics, but you don't really want to be running your electronics off a off a sine wave. Um, because you've got that, that hazy gray region where it doesn't know if it's coming or going. You just want to get through that as quickly as, as it can, is why you want a nice sharp clock edge. So functionality trading off against um, radio emissions. Do you get the harmonics with the um, multi-vibrator circuits? 
Yeah, you will. Um, sure. A a any any clock edge will have harmonics, but um, I'm not sure if my oscilloscope will pick them up because they're quite they're quite low. Uh, you you will see harmonics. Um, so if you had a higher frequency multi vibrator IC. It wouldn't give out a clean square wave. You'd have harmonics in there. Oh, every time. Yeah. Every, every time you, you, you can't you can't it, it's you can't get away from it. It's 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 a a, a phenomena, if you will. Yeah. A law of nature. Yes. Yeah. You can't have it all. Yeah. So you know. So whilst we know when we're learning electronics, you know, everything looks looks sweet and, and dandy. Um, but the real world is unfortunately a little bit more complicated. Right, let's hop back here, shall we? Very much is on. Right, so, oh, let's get the camera slightly away, shall we? Right. Image is hopefully still okay. Right, so the next uh, type of multi vibrator is, is the, oh, hang on, let's just refocus that. Is, is the good old uh, Polfix modulator. Where again, it's it's a worryingly simple equation um, where uh, we've got two resistors. This one here, maybe as to see, two resistors and and a capacitor, and there's also a diode across one of the um, resistors. Stephen, so, can you slide the page up a little bit, please? Some of the equations off the bottom. Does that work? Lovely. All right, hang on. Is that is that off the screen? Is it? That is off the screen. Yes. Yeah, that's off the bottom. That's interesting. Okay, right. Okay, here's a word to the wise. That's a Zoom screen uh, where you share a portion of the screen. Um, it's showing that being within. So um, it's, it's clearly not. Okay, then. There we go. Right. <clears throat> so dead easy equations again, you know. Um, oh, let's get rid of that. So dead, dead easy equations for us again. We've only got to worry about the the mark to space. So the sort of places that you'd use pulse modulation are servo motors. That that's a favourite. Um, but usually to set the position on a servo motor, you do actually have to supply a PWM um, signal, which we can have a tinker with in a second on the scope, <laughs> or um, uh, variable lights. The you know light, LED light dimming is really done on a PWM signal. So rather than just bearing the voltage, you just slam the thing on or off. And the other advantage of a motor control PWM, um, if you use pulse modulation to drive a DC motor, you'll be able to maintain the torque whilst controlling the speed. Whereas if you just use a variable voltage on a motor, um, <coughs> Once you'd vary the speed, you'd lose the torque. So there, there's many good reasons. So I've got on here, we can then pick up the oscilloscope. Fingers crossed. Right, I'm going to try and just set the oscilloscope up. Uh, right, bear with me a second. No, that's on AC, that's why. Uh, right, let's just swap cameras. Um, voltage level up there. Uh, right, yeah, there we go. That might do it. Right, so I've got the flashing LED, but I've got nothing on my scope. That's because that's grounded, that's why. <coughs> right, so. There we go. <clears throat> so for our, our PWM, what I've done here in our circuit, um, which is now off screen, of course. <clears throat> if we vary one resistor, we'll go back to the circuit in a second. Uh, th this is varying the um, mark. So that, that's, that's the, the high pulse is, is the mark. And the, and the bottom, of course, is the space. <clears throat> So I can vary the mark 
with that particular circuit without affecting the space. And if I vary the other resistor, I can vary the space. Yeah, but without affecting the mark. <clears throat> so, as I say, motor control is a perfect application for this. Stephen, something's been nagging at my mind. I keep seeing 0 0.7 appearing in these equations. I know. The is, that number. A, is that just 0 0.7 or is that um, 1 over root 2? Uh, it's, it's, it's 0.69. Um, it's not 1 over root 2. It's, I think you'll probably find it comes from the... I know when I wrote this, I kept seeing the magic number. Uh, when I, it's, uh, if you take the... I think is it the dB of minus, minus 3 which is half a power level, you get mm -hmm. 0.69. Yeah, it's, it's actually 0.69. I just rounded it to 0.7. Fair enough, thanks. I know. It's, 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 uh, when I read, I thought, oh, there's a bit of a trend here. It looks like I've, I've just copied and pasted. But no, it's, it's, it works. <clears throat> it's the because, capacitor time constant. Yes, when, when, when a capacitor charges, um, I'll just uh, backtrack it for you. Uh, oh no, hang on. Whoops, that one. I used to sort of regular RC networks, but not, I, I didn't know what this magic K was all about. Yeah, yeah. When a capacitor charges, um, it charges like that. Oh, well, it also doesn't go through. They go through zero, of course. And you've got a classic. Oh, classic voltage across capacitor. It's V naught one minus E to the minus T upon RC. If you remember that from uh, school days. So uh, yeah, if, if you if you work this all out, um, you'll eventually find that the threshold turned out to be at about 0.69. Uh, wasn't going to go into, into a huge math, so I'll end up getting lost in a, in a huge maths equation to, to prove it. But uh, 0.69 um, is is actually the the number which we end up using. There you go. That, that's in your screenshot now. Thanks. <clears throat> right. Okay. The last thing I've got on here for us is um, is very cool with phase shifting. Now then, this is going to take just two seconds just to put things on the right place on here. Right. So if I move that. So I think. Yeah, that needs to go on. Right, I'm just setting up my oscilloscope. Um, right, so the other sort of timer, really, with phase shifting, which we can look at, is a good old four bit binary counter. There we go, that's within screenshot, I hope. <coughs> yep, so four bit binary counter. Um, uh, oh, there we go. <clears throat> so all, all I've done, I've, I've just taken a, a an oscillator output and just driven it into this chip, uh, and then it does happily count. This is just this switch is just to turn the thing on and off. Otherwise, it get a bit confusing with it being flashing away whilst we're talking about other things. But What's interesting here is things that aren't all that they appear. So if I just clip on the oscilloscope here onto the lower bit. So I've put the oscilloscope on bit zero and bit one. And I've also put an oscilloscope here on the clock. So hopefully. Just going to swap to the oscilloscope and I'll show you what I found when I did this. Right, let's just adjust all these voltages a little bit. Make them sensible. Right, okay. Other way. Other way. Uh, right, 
So that should be that going to go up there. Let me use that just for a second. Turn that one off. So I'm just setting up the oscilloscope a second. The joys of doing things live. Right. Uh, there we go, two volts, probably not 20 volts, we'll never see it. All right, uh, so two. All right. Does that work? All right, and if I do trigger on one. Right, give that a second, I'll, I'll, I'll update in a second. There we go, it'll trigger and it'll show us stuff. Right, so what I've got here on the top trace, oh, let's just hit stop there a second. On the top trace, I've got my clock. And then from my four bit binary counter output, I've got a timing signal um, for this is bit zero in this purple color. And then below that, I've actually got my um, bit, bit one, the next one along. And to all intents and purposes, it looks like I've, my clock edge coincides with the data. I'm sure that looks like that's what we've got. In reality, that is not happening at all. What is really happening this is why then we need to look at phase shifting. As I zoom in, hopefully, it's worked earlier. What we'll see there we go. Let's freeze that. Right, so I've zoomed into the clock edge, and what you can see is the clock is actually before. The data. So if in your circuit you thought you were clocking the data and doing something with some data off it and you looked okay on the oscilloscope, in reality it's missed it altogether. And so there's two ways to fix that problem. One way to fix it, <coughs> if we can zoom out hopefully, One way to fix it. On the zoom. No, that might, I'll get there in a second. It's just thinking, there we go. Come on, come on, come on. There. Uh, one way to fix it is actually rather than going off the rising edge, is actually go off the falling edge. So what you never really want to do when you're using clocks, you never really want to have the clock um, acting at the same time as data changing. It's what we call a settle time. So really, rather than acting off this rising edge to collect any data, you'd be better off using what's called the falling edge, which is a 180 degree phase shift. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other way of doing it, <coughs> which is uh, which which is to use um, a little bit of phase shifting, which is what I've got here to show you. <clears throat> so if I just switch back here for us, I can show you, there we go. So this circuit here, if we put the other scope, so this is the phase shifter. <clears throat> so what we thought was happening was we could use this clock at the same time as our data changing, never do that. That's called a race hazard and we'll look at that when we get around to logic um, next month. 
Uh, I have actually seen at one of my very first jobs in Cambridge, a company that very occasionally the ADC on their detector circuit, because they, they were measuring uh, spectroscopy, very occasionally they'd get a, a messed up data result and they couldn't work out what it was. And after I went through it in detail, <coughs> I found out they were using the same rising edge to pick the data off at the same time in which the data was changing, and that's called a race hazard. So as soon as I changed it to the falling edge, the data was then settled and stable. The other way we can do that is what's called phase shifting, another phase shifting, which is just using a resistor and a capacitor. And um, there's a familiar number, 0.7 again. So the way this works is when that goes, when that's, go, that's zero and that's one, this will charge, but it'll charge, it'll take a time for that to charge to a voltage, which will trigger the Schmidt trigger. So it actually creates a delay. So what we tend to see is whilst the input might do that, and we can look at it in a second, <coughs> the output, we'll do it dotted, will actually be very slightly delayed, just like that. <clears throat> and we can see that on here, which if I just pop on the phase shift there, <clears throat> and fingers crossed this works. Right, if I switch on this camera, uh, on. We can speed this up a little bit. All right, there we go. Let's just drop that voltage. Right, so our blue line is our clock. Uh, so, the, so the yellow one's our clock and the blue one is our, our phase shift. Uh, so what we should be able to do, fingers crossed, if I change that resistor. There you go, see look, it's starting mm -hmm. to shift the clock. Uh, and that also then means that <coughs> When we had all those harmonics, we can now start to, <clears throat> whilst you won't be able to change the harmonics, you can move them around so they happen at a slightly different point in time. So then you'll end up with less radio emissions or, or the power, I should say, in that particular frequency won't be such, such a high amplitude which will then reduce your, your radio emissions. <clears throat> and which is why if you look at uh, like a lot of FPGA chips, uh, you'll, you'll see that you might get like four or five clock inputs. <clears throat> so you can end up with quite a complicated clock structure um, for, your, for your digital electronics. So FPGAs, I think last time I did an FPGA, I think we had like four, four, four or eight different clocks running into it. Or to make things happen at slightly different times. Um, so you know, if we wanted speed, so with this one here, we, we could then just adjust that. Oh, just a little bit of that. So that's phase shift. So possibly if we now zoom in. There we go. So you can see now. There we go, look. So we zoom in now. <clears throat> so now we're, we're, in, we're in a much better place, aren't we? So, so you, you may even get away with just using a logic gate. You know, you mentioned earlier about using a knock gate. Uh, you, you might get away with, um, you know, when you have multiple knock gates for that loop, you might actually get away 
uh, with rather than using some fancy RC network or just um, just using a NOT gate or, 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 or any buffer. I have used an inverter chain and taken taps every second inverter for uh, sort of prop delay phase change. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. All, all, all sorts of clever tricks. So um, not, I, I guess the moral of the story is um, nothing is what it seems, is it? <laughs> anyway, um, that, that's my last piece of paper. Look. Um, let's see if I move back to the other camera. Then. Right. Well, look, we, we had a bit of a, a technical problem there, didn't we, at the start with, which um, uh, I, I apologize for not noticing that myself. Um, but I think, I think in the end we got away with it. So, uh, any 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 questions? Anything you want me to run over again for you? Just to make sure I understood the last point about multiple clocks on your FPGAs. That's just to put all of your harmonics out of phase with each other, so they don't constructively accumulate <laughs> in magnitude. That's one of the advantages. Yes. Uh, I mean, you might want clocks running at different frequencies. Uh, they actually call it, um, I think it's called um, spectrums, uh, spread spectrum clocks. Where, where, where they'll, they'll try and move, 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 you know, some of the clocks around a little bit. Um, you know, so, so, you, so you don't get these, um, you know, massive, massive harmonics. I mean, so, so project I worked on, they, we had a 27 megahertz clock on the board. And it was actually for measuring the um, the profile of car tires. Now it turns out most cars have a standard width. Uh, the tires are, are a fixed distance apart, and it turned out that the 27 megahertz was a quarter wavelength of the distance between two car tires or on on the front of a car. <clears throat> and so naturally, then the cable was the world's most perfect antenna <laughs> <laughs> because the car wasn't going to get any slimmer or wider was it <laughs> so uh yeah we have to uh, all, all sorts of problems like, like that pop up um, and if you ever get have a chance to go to an emc test site um the horror stories that people will tell you that that, that they have uh, some of the worst ones are actually screens uh, like LCD screens, or you know, uh, like like your your oh, it's here, isn't it? Your your mobile phone screen. The, the, these are the worst things for 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 clock clock noise coming off them, because there, there's cables running around. So uh, yeah, these present massive problems. The next event I've got for you is on the third of February. Right. Okay. Should we close there and have cups of tea? Thank you very much, Stephen. Yeah, thank you right. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Talk to you soon. My pleasure. Yeah, Talk to you soon. Okay, then. Bye thank for now. You. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.